get this podcast rolling. On today's Sound Iron Podcast, we have David Shaw, who is a Scottish-based composer and Twitch streamer. Excited to talk to you about how Twitch streaming is going and some personal projects you got going on. Welcome to the show, David. Nice to be here. Could you start by telling us about music in your childhood? Like, uh, were your parents musicians? Did you grow up in a musical family? How did you get to where you are now? So I, uh, I didn't really have, I had a very musical childhood, but I didn't have any parents that were uh, musical. Um, I've just got a, like my parents love listening to music. My dad really it loved and encouraged everything musical. Um, so I started actually uh, learning guitar uh, when I was the first instrument I picked up when I was eight years old. And um, it was a lot of fun. I ended up learning like loads of loads of different styles over the years as everyone does that picks up a guitar the first thing you want to play is probably things like rock music or whatever it is that you're listening to Mm -hmm. so i was really interested in that for um a long period of time and then kind of got into uh, a kind of more acoustic finger style stuff when i was a little bit older and then uh, when i was at school i ended up uh, learning drums and because i needed two instruments when i was doing music um, and I've always been involved in uh, sort of doing vocal stuff in choirs and stuff too. What kind of what kind of bands were your parents playing you? Like what what kind of music were you listening to in the house? Quite, like quite a quite a big variety, to be honest with you. Um, like nice. a lot of uh, Clapton, things like the Gypsy Kings, even. And then sort of as it went on, it was also like a very, very big sort of metal phase and sort of um, yeah, sort of metal phase and, and sort of prog phase. Um, but also uh, other artists like um, John Martin, who's a John Martin's a Scottish sort of interesting performer. He's 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 dead now, but he used to do. He started off as a folk musician, but then he kind of went into essentially I would call it jazz fusion okay. towards the the end of his career. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, just just a whole bunch of whole bunch of things. The shotgun approach and see what sticks. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. So after high school, what uh, what kind of further education did you do? So after high school, I ended up going to college. Uh, did a year at college, um, doing uh, music. Basically, it sort of it was first year uni level. Okay. Um, and that was kind of where I found my love of composing. Uh, it wasn't actually um, like I, I left after that year, like I loved it. But the problem I had was um, like I really I found myself really torn at that point because I loved composing. And that was something that, that appeared at that point. But for me to continue composing, if I'd kept doing the course, they were working on making you the best session musician and the best performer that mm-hmm. you could be. So I would have had to have done a, a further year with no composing module and then I would get one the next year and um my I must admit like I really kind of was it was taking its toll on my mental health so I left and uh got a job and then eventually started composing kind of after that cool you kind of like just started picking up clients doing um online work or how did you how did you find like gigs and start composing for media I didn't actually originally jump straight into composing for media. Um, I mean, like I said, I'd kind of hit taking quite a bad uh, mental health hit at the time. So what happened was um, I ended up leaving, uh, like I left college and obviously was kind of spiraling a little bit. And it was my, uh, it was actually my wife that ended up saying to me at one point that um, just because my mental health was bad, she was like, you really, really enjoyed composing. Why don't you, you know, buy a, um, because we'd been using Logic at college, she said, why don't, you, why don't you buy a Mac and get Logic and just start composing again? So in 2014, that's what I did. And I literally just started writing music just for my mental health and for the, for the you know, fun of writing music mm-hmm. and the love of writing music. And it was, it, I didn't get my first gig until like three years later. It wasn't until 2017. Um, although I'd been kind of, I'd been online and I'd met people. I, I'd never really, I never really felt confident 
enough to um to jump into it and do composing as a like even as a I never even thought I was good enough to to do it as a, a career or anything sure. um I ended up just doing it uh for fun and I have I still have the hard drive of like about 2000 or something ideas that I made over these three years wow. and then my, fr- my friend asked like gave me a shot and said that they needed music for a film uh, for a documentary they needed some cues and gave me the usual time scale of three months which I wasn't really ready for. So I opened up my library of loads of tracks and said, right, these are probably, I give them about 20 odd. And I said, I think these are the most appropriate. Use those and we'll see. <laughs> and they still got me to, to score it on top of that. And I had to kind of rework some stuff. It was a really, really cool sort of gig, but that was also a bit of a trial by fire. I ended up learning a lot of things. And then since then, honestly, it's just been, it's, it's just been like connecting with people online um just networking meeting more people and then i've just found out that that's that's kind of where gigs come from sure. more than more than uh sometimes applying for things if you know what i mean yeah 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 100 so um tell us about twitch you have uh you do like once a week or so twitch streams and i i tuned into a little bit of one um today and you're like very lighthearted and like joking around with the audience and you're uh you're really you're great on camera so um tell us about like how you got started with that and what it's like juggling composing in front of an audience and like kind of the back and forth with the chat sure um funnily enough that in some ways also was a mental health thing (laughs) the reason i got started with twitch was because of uh when we had the pandemic in 2020 uh here in scotland we got put into sort of a pretty pretty strict lockdown from kind of October well it was earlier but like probably October the 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 things didn't really lift um until like one day in December so we had months of uh, not actually being able to see people inside and obviously it was winter Mm -hmm. um I had a friend actually that was playing games uh, on Twitch and um, because we couldn't see anyone, and I'm, a, I'm really a, an extrovert, I really needed to see people, I ended up um, basically going online and just basically spending almost like every night with this guy and just staying and chat and chatting to him. And there was, yeah, then meant that I got to know his, uh, I got to know like the group of people, I got to know more people on Twitch that were doing it regularly. And I became his moderator after, I think probably after about a month, um, which was really useful because it meant I learned like the etiquette of how to um, how to deal with Twitch, um, things like raiding after a stream. It's not essential, but it's usually like quite a nice way of, of basically taking your audience and sharing them with someone new. And yeah. it's a good way of sort of meeting people. And I learned like a load of these kind of, uh, a load of these etiquette things um, for that month. And it wasn't until partway through it that I thought, you know, why not, why, why don't I just give it a go? Um, so I started, I think I started in November, 2020, uh, actually streaming um, and I wasn't sure what to do, but I ended up just starting by making music. It's kind of grown from there. I've now got like a really, really nice, uh, there's a really nice community that I'm part of. I found that um, being a composer on Twitch is really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I spent a lot of time on Twitch sort of watching and researching, interacting with a lot of people during sort of the first year. The thing that I found from streaming is that people that are uh, gamers usually... I was going to say usually do better in the music scene. People that do best on Twitch are usually people that are playing covers or live looping. If you do anything else, because I've seen mixing streams on Twitch, I've seen composing streams on Twitch, usually it's quite hard to do a a composing stream or a mixing stream or something because the only people that usually would be in your chat are people that, like, unless you've already got an audience on something like YouTube, it's either going to be that or it's going to be potentially other composers that come in, which isn't a problem. But if you're wanting to, to reach a wider audience, it's a little bit hard. So you've got to somehow, so you've got to try and kind of find a way of um, not just making music. I find that when I'm tired and I stream, I end up just making music. Um, and I'm quite fortunate that I have, like I said, I've got, I've got a lot of people that usually just come in and listen. So Sometimes, like if if anyone turned up, sometimes my chat might seem dead and isn't and no one talking. But there's people watching me because they want to to listen to what I'm creating, um, which is usually like quite a a nice thing. Yeah, 
Would you say in the last two years, Twitch has grown the music side of things? Like, have they been pushing the music channels at all or like um, trying to engage more people into the music uh, streaming? Um, Potentially, yes. I I think they probably have. Um, We've seen a bit of a dip because obviously like it was huge over over the height of lockdown. Kind of that it was kind of the first three months of of um, of 21. Yeah. were were pretty brutal that was that was kind of like twitch hit its height and then since then it's kind of gone down but it isn't it hasn't like gone down loads people still actually watch streams it's just ever since sort of shall i say normality has has returned i'd say that they have probably pushed the music but there's not a lot of com- there's still i wouldn't say there's a lot of composing streamers or if there are they usually are quite buried it's quite you have to really go digging if you want to see someone compose music live yeah, because they have that whole music channel now. I don't remember when they added that because before it was like just chatting or, you know, certain things like that. But then I saw those, you know, kind of coming back to it. I remember I made one a long time ago, but messed with it here and there. And then coming back to it, and I noticed it seemed like there was a lot more music stuff happening. Like you were saying, people like performing or doing just like live improv. Like um, there's a lot of that kind of stuff or people just like making beats or just DJing or, you know, there's like a bunch of different types of people on there yeah i i definitely i would say that like basically the the hierarchy in terms of like the amount of channels and stuff that i've seen the the, it usually goes people that are live looping and just making music um, and like are playing covers are like the top and it's also the easiest way in some ways to probably get to partner where people will actually watch you is basically Mm -hmm. putting on a concert that is that is kind of the easiest way it's not i mean it's not easy but compared to all the other ways of making music, it's the easiest. And then after that, there's a lot of people that make beats on Twitch. And then after that, you get people that are actually composing or doing production. And that's a very small percentile of mm-hmm. people that are doing it. So how did you get past the nerves of composing in public? Because like I've had internships and stuff where the composer was like oh you'll need to leave the room while i write this like this is sacred stuff that i'm i'm doing you know like uh certain composers get really really antsy and intense about their creative process so how Mm -hmm. did how did you get comfortable there that's a that's a good it's a good point i suppose in some ways it's kind of about the stream really uh it's it's quite i'm not sure if i've ever really got comfortable i mean i'm not gonna lie i feel really nervous when i press that start like streaming button Mm -hmm. and i feel really nervous after i finish it like whenever i finish a stream regardless of the time i need to chill out like Hmm. because i have so much energy regardless of how like either it's gone really well or really badly that's the the, actually an interesting thing with um, streaming is that the highs are super high and the lows are crushing you know like but regardless of the stream i get off stream and i'm like i have to decompress i can't just go to bed because like i'm (laughs) wired either for good or not good and i need to chill out either way but yeah it's uh actually getting past that um that fear is it's it's one of these things that like being on stream is also quite useful for being accountable because there isn't there isn't a guarantee anybody's there like that's the the thing so in some ways it's like what's the worst that could happen if somebody comes in and, and chat, you know, either they'll they'll be nice and they'll speak to you, or if they're an ass, you can ban them, you can time them out, you can get rid of them, you can even ignore them. I mean, wouldn't advise the ignoring them because that kind of hurts the um it, it's hard to build your channel if you aren't being aware of chat. That's actually one of the hardest things when you're composing, is like if you're in the zone, it's Definitely really hard to like, like Yeah really hard to come out and like make sure you're still engaged with chat which is kind of what i was saying when i was like saying i I, when i'm tired i'm like more likely to be just like focus on making the music (laughs) you know but yeah like in terms of getting past it it's one i think in some ways it's one of these things you probably have to just don't jump in the deep end so it gets slightly easier as you do it more and more right yeah so craig is is kind of dipping his toe into twitch a little bit uh twitch streaming so what advice do you have for somebody starting out like mr craig peters here if you are starting out, I would suggest the first thing to do is watch streamers or ask them if you have anybody that's a friend or something. Just engage with engage with chat. Watch maybe 
I, I don't know. Don't just watch one streamer. Try and watch like a couple. I'm not saying you have to watch a whole stream, but just if you watch more, you, you'll see how they deal with chat, how they deal with things like moderation, how they deal with, like I said, things like raids. There's there's a whole bunch of, um, if you're not even taken into the, the technical aspects of like OBS and all that, like there, there's a whole bunch of like etiquette. It isn't important, but it really helps. And after doing after doing that, after sort of speaking to somebody or um, watching, like I said, yeah, either either speaking to somebody or watching streams, the best thing to do, like I said, if you have an audience, would be tell them about it, promote it. Doesn't matter where, put it on Twitter if you've got a Twitter. Put it on, you know, just say, hey, look, I'm going to be starting a stream. This is when. Please come along. Say hi. And then after that, go to your friends. Go to anybody else. Tell them because it's a lot easier to do a stream if somebody even chats. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it's it makes a big difference. I mean, it like I said, it doesn't happen all the time, and in some ways, you have to prepare for that. Sometimes when you are streaming and you're starting, nobody will turn up, and it will just be you alone. And the hardest thing is to keep chatting, but it's also the most important because mm-hmm. nobody wants to watch you make music and just make music. They want to watch you make music and engage with them or yeah. chat about them. And you can literally talk about anything, but you just have to kind of keep it going. And it's super hard because even I don't get it right all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I've heard. Like there, like when it comes to Twitch or just turning out like the art of talking to yourself. It's so hard. And I think I think we probably subconsciously do that anyway, even when we are just working by ourselves. Like, hmm, I don't know. I think I want to play around with this reverb. Let me grab this one. Actually, no, I remember this. It's like you kind of have these like internal little like things going on in your head anyway, because you're like always sort of thinking or what about this? So it's just almost instead of just being in your head, just kind of talking about your process. Like if like that's what I would do, like, because the last one I, I was just randomly like, I'm going to start, you know, trying to do one once a week, either on mine or the Sound Iron one. You know, there wasn't really anyone in there because it was just kind of a random spur of the moment thing just to like kind of start doing it and testing it out and seeing if it works. And yeah, it's almost just you have to just talk to yourself, you know, and if you see someone ask a question or something like, oh, what was that? Or, you know, then you can go in and explore things or like, oh, you know, so that like to me, I think is the cool thing. Like if there are people that have questions about stuff, you know, being able to answer that or or maybe get inspired like i don't know like what should i do here and someone's like put a piano like all right cool let's let's bust out a piano or something you know like just so it's kind of like how it would be if you were hanging out with your friends and you know like if you guys were you know if we're all hanging out in someone's studio like oh what about that or blah 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 you know kind of makes it feel a little bit more like that versus just like tunnel yeah, vision yeah. i mean the, the other thing to bear in mind as well is depending on who's in the chat this could be both a good thing or a bad thing, just depending what your channel's like. Because I've seen mm-hmm. some that are like super chaotic. Mine is really chilled, but like you do have to kind of prepare as well for trolls. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that always in a bad way, but like I've embraced it in some ways. So I have some redeemables on my channel. Like I've got a cowbell redeemable. When it gets redeemed, I have to add a cowbell in it, regardless <laughs> of. I have one for a saxophone as well. And for me, these two things have like come in because chat has absolutely spammed it constantly and been like, oh, I want this. And so I've just, you just give the people what they want. If they, um, But it does mean at times that like I sometimes am making a piece of music and I'll be making a nice like orchestral piece. And sometimes you have to lay down the law a little because I have had people be like, chuck an air who on that put an hurdy gurdy in and I'm like, I appreciate it, but not this one. We'll do it next time, mm-hmm. you know? But then it's like a fine line of like trying to make sure that it's still entertaining for chat, but the same, you know, because like if, if you're constantly knocking back those sort of things, then you'll, you know, some of your audience will be like, I'm not interested. And then some of them will be like, okay, fair enough. So yeah, yeah it's like I said, it's always a fine line. <laughs> you're like, I can't put cowbell in everything. Yeah, I know. Well, There's only so much cowbell. You think that. <laughs> and then Christopher Walken comes in the chat and you're in, your, in chat and you're like, yes. Exactly. I will put cowbell on everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. So when you're overwhelmed or unfocused, what do you do? Do you have any tips or tricks? Um, in general or on stream? <laughs> Either one. <laughs> That's what I'm curious about when it comes to like the composing stuff on stream, because that's the thing that always would kind of make me nervous. Like, 
you're really setting yourself up to where like, I got to be creative right now. And that could be a little bit nerve wracking because you're like, well, like, what if I'm just doing some live composing and I'm just like hitting roadblocks? Like, oh God, do I want to look like I don't know what the hell I'm doing or, you know? That is a tricky thing. I'm I'm not going to lie. Like I more or less start every stream being like, so I have no idea what I'm doing today. We always yeah. end with a finished piece, but like, I always start being like, I have not planned this because yeah. I don't, I don't know. And usually that's... It, in terms of stream, the best thing to do is either just pick a sound, pick a sample, or pick, pick something and just play around. And if it doesn't work, throw it away. Like, you know, don't like hit your head against a brick wall for two hours being like, hey, so I'm trying to do this piano thing, but like, I just, I'm getting nothing. Like, try it for 10 minutes. If it doesn't work, put it down, pick something else up, and mm -hmm. you will get inspired in some way. Other than that, though, like in terms of when you're not on stream, I'm not very good at it, but I usually would. Uh, I, I, should, I was going to say I usually would go out for a walk or something. In all honesty, I probably I would get dragged out for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like when I when I hit um, Roblox, I just the best thing to do is stop, even if it's just for 15 minutes. It doesn't have to be like stop for a day or a week, you know, go away, do something else, try and clear your head and then come back to it. And if something's still not like, if it's still not going, then go and listen to some music or do something like whatever you enjoy. If you enjoy listening to music, go and find, you know, go and find some music and listen that you enjoy listening to. Just do that. Go and relax. Do whatever you need to do to get yourself out of that headspace. Because honestly, as good as deadlines are, if you haven't got a deadline, you don't actually need, you know, unless there's, there's a real reason that you need to get something done or out, then it may not be the most important thing to to get it finished, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is consistency on Twitch something that they reward, like YouTube, or is it more like community-based and it doesn't matter as much? Um, In some ways, yes. I wouldn't say that Twitch rewards it as such. From what I've seen, I think like the front page of Twitch is primarily for partners and potentially affiliates. But if you're an affiliate, usually it's for like a good cause. And I'm not saying like there are loads of charity streams. So like, it's not that they have a particular thing. It's more like if you're super lucky, you'll get on the front page. So in terms of like Twitch rewarding you, I wouldn't necessarily say so. However, consistency is very, very much key for growing your fan base. Because if you're able to say, like I said, even on Twitter and stuff, if you're able to say, hey, look, I'm live every Monday, mm -hmm. you know, obviously that you can take time off, but you do sometimes see a little bit of dip if you, you know, whenever you're off. That doesn't mean you can't take a holiday. You should still take a holiday. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, you know, like when you come back, it's not going to be quite where it was. But it's something to to definitely consider because, yeah, consistency is definitely key because otherwise no one knows where you're on. Yeah. So for anyone who is maybe just getting into it, like myself, affiliate and partner, like what are the differences between those? Because I've heard some people say like, oh, I finally reached affiliate or like extra benefits for being partner versus just an affiliate. Sure, sure. So uh, Twitch has two systems. Well, three, if you include that there is none. You can be a streamer, right? Which has no benefits whatsoever. Uh, you have to meet some criteria to get to affiliate. By that, in the period of a month or 28 days, you have to have had an average viewership of three people. You need to have 50 followers and you need to have streamed eight hours worth of content over seven different days slash streams. So those are, if you're consistent and you keep at it, those are relatively attainable. Obviously, the 50 followers can sometimes be tricky. The Average is probably the hardest thing, um, especially when you're starting out. But if you have, um, like I said, if you start off probably in quite a good foot, sort of marketing it first by saying like, hey, we're going live, you know, any support would be appreciated um, and grow it from there. It's an entirely possible thing to do. If you're an affiliate, you can essentially monetize your stream. It means that you can get channel points that you can create that your viewers can, um, you know, basically ask you to do near enough anything, just whatever you, you, you set these though. So like I said, with mine, I have some redeemables of, I've got a first redeemable that if someone clicks it, it says when they're first in chat, I've got um, this add a cowbell. I've got like things that basically would make the stream more entertaining. Aside from channel points, you also then get, you also have emote slots so you can have custom emotes for your channel and people can, uh, 
pay money either in bits or they can subscribe to your channel and support you as an artist, Twitch obviously takes a cut. But if you're an affiliate, you get some of that money back as well as, like I said, you get ad revenue as well. So there's adverts for, for affiliates. A par partner is essentially the same thing, except Twitch gives partners more of the money than they do affiliates. Okay. However, to get to a partner uh, level, you need to, I think, have put in enough hours uh, I can't remember the numbers exactly. It's 12 streams, though, near enough. Um, I can't remember how many hours. Again, that's not really the, the difficulty. The difficulty with it is it's 75 viewer average, which is a mm. massive bump up. Um, and like I said, you need to have been streaming probably for about half a month um, within the month, you know, mm -hmm. and you need to have 75 viewers as your average. And even then, unlike affiliate, where it's guaranteed the minute you hit the criteria, you'll get an email. With partner, it only means that when you hit that criteria, you can apply for it. And they don't always make, they don't always like necessarily let someone just become a partner straight. Do you have to maintain that? Like, let's say even after you become partner, do you have to still maintain? Or is it like, all right, cool. Now, if your average dips here and there, like you're not going to get it revoked or something? Or Yeah. Um, so I think. In the in the contract, because obviously you end up signing a contract with Twitch that gives them twenty four hour exclusivity, and um, so you can't actually stream it both on Twitch and Facebook Live or YouTube at the same time. It means that you'd have to you know give it twenty four hours before reposting anywhere. But the Twitch stuff means that um, I'm not sure about partner, but I'd imagine it's a similar to affiliate, which is basically if you stop. If you essentially stop streaming, they say that they can take away your your status after a year. But realistically, I'm I'm not entirely sure if they would or weren't, wouldn't. Um, because I've I've heard people that have put it down and then picked it up again, and it's not gone after a year. Mm -hmm. Um, it's more that there's the potential for that. Oh, okay. Partner's really hard to get to. Like, yeah. um, a lot of streamers. I've met a lot of streamers that have come in and have said, "Oh, I'm going to, uh, you know, like I'm going to." Come in the stream, I'm going to make partner. And honestly, it's, you know, I even toyed with the idea right when I started. And then when I realized what was involved, I thought, you know what, like, I don't, I don't currently stream enough to even do the hours. But honestly, with, with the hassle of it, it's not, it's not something I'm aiming for. Yeah. Do you have like a schedule or anything? I've always heard people say that it's good to have, you know, some kind of weekly schedule, like, mm -hmm. oh, like Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays I'll stream or, or, one day a week or you know something yeah. like that so i used well i used to um, I, i've chopped and changed with my schedule to try and sometimes just to match my life actually when i started i was doing two days a week i was doing a saturday and a tuesday um and then i got a film and i was working on a film as well as streaming and i just couldn't keep up with two days so i just cut it back to one recently i've just i've swapped my days again so i'm literally just doing a monday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, GMT or BST, depending on whether it's summer or not. Um, and aside from that, I, I've i actually started doing a second stream on a Wednesday during the day, which is usually a, a co-working stream, which is very different from music. But it's basically just like focus periods of, of basically me working for like, I will work and not really engage with chat for like half an hour. And then after that, I can't sort of have a 15 minute break and chat to everybody. And it's really kind of like a way of being productive. I've got some work that I'm currently working on that's not, that I'm finding really difficult to do. So breaking it down into these chunks is actually a really nice way of doing it. But yeah, schedules are very, very important. Yeah, it seems like like having some kind of, you know, even with YouTube, people do that too. Like, oh, a new video every Friday or something or things like that. Just having that so people know when to expect versus just kind of, oh, they just randomly went live. Because like I have some people that I follow and it'll just like, I'll just be in an email and it's like, oh, they went live. Oh, cool. I'll go check it out. If you're maybe you don't see them posted on socials or something like that, it's just kind of, you're kind of left up to, well, I guess whenever they go live, I don't, yeah. So Random. Kind of. Yeah, you kind of know when like, oh, every day, you know, at 10 a.m. I'll, I'll be streaming or something. So you have that kind of, you know, it's like a TV show that you always watch. You kind of know when to go tune in sort of thing. Yeah. Could you tell us about a personal project you're excited about? Yeah. So I'm I'm currently um, working on the biggest project I have ever worked on. Nice. In my career, which is uh, very exciting. Um, I am currently tr writing a space concept album and short story book along with it and it's taken far longer than i thought it would 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, that sounds massive. Especially yeah. when you're dealing with space, man. It's like yeah. that can go anywhere. The void. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. But no, it's it's been it's been very good. I started writing it. I didn't realize I was writing it, but as part of my three years of writing um, music for myself, I wrote some pieces that were always going to be just they, they were always part of something, um, or like they were really good ideas, but they've just been gathering digital dust, um, and no one was ever going to hear them. Like unless I do something with it, so mm-hmm. it was the first place I went when I when I made this story. Um, I've got sort of I've got the overarching plot. I know what's going to happen, and so I started writing this thing probably in 2014, but got serious about it this year. And um, since then, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of grown arms and legs. I've still got quite a lot of the book to actually write, um, at least for my first draft. Um, however, the album's been going better. I've probably got about four tracks, three or four, uh, four tracks left to to write, and then I've got the the version one of the whole album, and I then need to start actually recording properly. So, yeah, it's it's uh, coming together, but these things all just take such a long time. Mm-hmm. Do you have a set instrumentation that you're using? Is it like live instruments versus virtual, or how do you choose that kind of stuff? So for this album, I'm consider i'm going to be tracking live drums live vocals live guitars uh the drums is going to be an interesting one because i usually just use vst drums but i really feel that live drums would bring something really nice so it's a bit of an interesting one because i wasn't intending on tracking live drums and some of the music that i've written is quite complicated and like rhythmically you know with some odd meters and stuff Mm -hmm. uh, which is fine when you put that into midi and you go yeah that sounds great but i'm looking at i'm gonna have to record that which makes it go, hmm, right. <laughs> yeah. So, right. so you're going to you're gonna play all the drums on it? You're not going to hire anyone to collaborate on it, like playing any of the parts, or it's just all you? Yeah, basically. I mean, so the guitars will probably be done by my, um, my friend who's a sound engineer. Uh, he's probably going to help with some of the guitar work. Aside from that, though, all the vocals uh, I'll track, all the drums I'm going to try and do. Uh, yeah, that's, and then we'll see where it goes from there. But yeah, it's been interesting actually. As I've written it, I've been trying to figure out like what would I. Use? It's the same as way I, I try um, record drums even in MIDI. I, I I think to myself like what would I play, and it, it honestly just makes it so much easier rather than just being like, oh, this is amazing. I could do this really complex thing like rhythmically. Yeah. Do you do a lot? Do you do a lot of air drumming when you're actually programming? I, I used to do that a lot, where I would actually think about how this would actually be performed instead of just kind of doing all this crazy shit. It's like trying to make it like, how how would I actually do this if I was playing it? Or even if you can't fully like play it on a real kit, you could at least kind of be able to, you know, see how it works with the music. Do you ever do anything like that? Or I, I, I do. I do very often. Not not so much when I'm not when I'm uh, recording the the beats of the the drums because that's obviously usually a lot more simple but like when i get to doing fills yeah i usually will sit there and be like okay what do i want to play probably like no 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 and that's that's when i start figuring it out and then that usually obviously takes a bit of time mm-hmm. in midi could you tell us about a typical day in the life for you are you a morning person evening person or like uh how do you prep for twitch streams any any sort of like schedule that you keep throughout the day of a uh, composing like an average an average david day sure uh well i am very much a night person however i prefer getting up in the morning not that i'm i'm definitely not a morning person so i'm definitely like a bit of a zombie um mm-hmm. so i'll probably get up at like just before nine and i mean like roll out of bed at like five to nine um and then depending on what i'm working on i will probably start work like on a queue or whatever yeah I, I just wake myself up i'm not very good at although though i'm not a morning person coffee and all these other things with caffeine do nothing for me so mm. i have to naturally wake up regardless you're a brave man <laughs> yeah it's 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 a bit of an interesting one i've I, obviously a bit different to to not touch not touch caffeine in that way but yeah i, I just I, I would get up i probably just if i was working on a queue i will just deal with that I, I find with for me music is something that i'm very passionate about and i find really easy to get in that headspace but i mean like probably hyper focus so there are days that i will start at nine 
and it'll probably get to it could potentially get to six at night and my wife will be like have you eaten breakfast have you eaten lunch have you done anything <laughs> you know so that, that would actually be on my day off because on a typical day i usually i still also am juggling um a day job as well so i'm usually thankfully working from home so doing both yeah but that is it's crazy because a lot of People who even just do composing, that's probably what they're doing. You know, like I've, I've talked with composers that would easily do like 18 hour days and they're like, yeah, like they just, you know, it's just a normal thing. Like that's just the way it is. And then you hear a lot of people that want to get into composing and it's grueling, especially with like deadlines and dealing with like all these different moving parts and dealing with producers and directors and all these other people it's 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 absolutely mental i mean you have to you have to have a serious love for it and i think you, there's also there's no real time for complacency it's not i wish if i could change anything about composing i wish that people would have more time to do it because usually composing is usually an afterthought especially mm -hmm. when it comes to like films like if you're lucky you'll get three months and you've got 90 minutes 120 minutes plus to compose for and that's before that's before any revisions and then any revisions that come after that you have to get all that signed off and then you still need to get it mixed and mastered and if you're lucky enough to get live performers that needs to be done first as well and you need to get the copyists or you need to actually get the notation like that stuff it's like doing that in three months is grueling for anyone so yeah it's it's never an easy thing i do wish they would give us more time just because you could actually, like deadlines are really useful. It means you can push yourself and get it done. Mm -hmm. And it's really an amazing sense of achievement when you manage. But it's also like, just if it's just so, so tricky. And you do have to make sacrifices sometimes to just to make it work. Yeah. It's like, I, I feel that's why I was like, I feel like I would be more into doing video game scores than, than film scores, just because like, it seems like a lot more of the, the composers are brought in early. You know, mm -hmm. there may there might be a little bit of footage, or it's mostly like images, or you know, here's kind of like some storyboard stuff. You know, because you'll hear about you know composers working on you know being involved for maybe even a couple of years. You know, just working on stuff here and there, or working on a couple of games in a year or something like that. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. I think that like that's that's kind of the ideal. Um, but even then, the the other sort of part of that as well is the time scale. Sometimes, even if you have a year. Um, the amount of music that he's created for a game is also like sometimes just so much more than a film, mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of other things to consider because like when you're writing when you're writing film uh, music, like the the scenes should be locked, and um, you know like that stuff doesn't change. You only have to write for this sort of specific thing, but when you're having to write sometimes forty hours of music that also moves depending on what's going on suddenly like three months wouldn't cut it like that year might not actually be quite as luxurious as it sounds mm -hmm. although i totally agree with you like game game scores are like a ton of fun and i, I definitely enjoy uh, working on those when i get the chance mm -hmm. do you feel like you have a little bit more musical freedom doing a game versus a film as far as being able to kind of shape the sound of a game yeah i i, I think in some ways yes Probably more because of, uh, I, I think it's probably more because games are newer and films, obviously, I mean, the films have been going around for, for longer, but like the thing is that there's also a lot of uh, tropes that people expect. You know, if you're making like a horror film, like mm -hmm. you're not going to have a lighthearted comedy soundtrack. Like if you tried that, guarantee you the, the director or the producer or whoever is going to come to you and you'll be like, this is wrong. Do it, like try again. You know, that's, that's, whereas, Video games are, you're right, like there's a lot more kind of artistic freedom in some ways. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. It's Maybe cool. not always, depending on if like the people doing the game are like, we want, this is the, the yeah. sound, you know, and they could send you a bunch of temp tracks to something, you know, or something like that. But I would like, I would like to see a horror movie that's scored like a dramedy. That would be amazing. <laughs> you know, like they're peeking around the corner. Here, boom, 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 boom. It would be it'll, little it'll, it'll flutes and stuff. Like a, exactly, it would become like a cult classic. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'd probably be like Troll or something if you've ever seen those old horror movies. It'd yeah. probably end up being like that because like the music for that's very like it almost sounds like fantasy music and just like super cheesy. Like I was watching The Gate the other day, like and just like thinking of like old horror movies, like that just they have those scores that are little, you know, well not a little, they're super dated, but it's kind of now horror movies are not done that way at all. They're like way too serious. Yeah. You got to be the change you want to see in the world, Craig. 
That's that right. Is. I'm going to make my own horror movie and I'm going to score it using nothing but pizzicatos. So we already made the today. Sound Iron Sickening video. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that, that's a. Uh, yeah, we that should, was fun. We should rescore it. Your, I was gonna say that'll be your your Halloween, <laughs> your Halloween video. <laughs> yeah, we did this uh, like goofy parody off of like ghost hunting shows, mm. where we all got together and just like filmed a bunch of stupid stuff. Yeah, it's on the YouTube somewhere. If you want to see us being idiots? <laughs> so with the concept album, David, um, you don't have any hard deadlines. So how are you kind of keeping that self motivation? Do you have like calendar milestones that you're setting or what, what's some hacks or tips that you have to kind of just keep, keep the pedals turning? That's, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I have, I've kind of like slightly put the brakes on the, the book bit because like I said, music's easy for me. Words are hard. <laughs> sure. Yeah, writing <laughs> lyrics is tough. Yeah, yeah. So like that's not it's not been too bad. For me, that's where the uh these co-working streams uh have been really, really beneficial because it's like I I am accountable when I go live. Because even if no one's there, like if, if someone's there, I somebody's watching. If mm-hmm. no one's there, there's still a record. So if I decided to faff around and be on my phone for an hour or two hours and not do any work, like I can do that, sure, I'm an adult. But at the same time, like I'll watch that back and I'll be like, oh, it was a bit of a wasted thing. But yeah, I mean, like for somebody that was having issues with that, I totally agree. Like things like calendars um, and, and, and setting yourself sort of maybe softer deadlines probably would be beneficial. For me, I've, I'm, it's not something I'm needing to do at the minute because like I've got like motivation to do this because like I have been at this now for, I think I started looking at the concept about a year ago. And like, I am quite ready for this to be done and I still have miles to go. So mm. right now I'm just kind of like, I just want it written and then I'll like, I'll work out the rest. I think there probably will be a bit of a, a slog. I would probably say in a couple of months, once I've got it written, because then I might be sick of it and be like, okay, I don't want to record this. Um, yeah. And that'll probably be when I have to start thinking about like, do it like breaking it down that's kind of the the main thing i would say is like just if you can like try not to look at the the sort of big full picture of it because especially if it's something like this it's just so big it's ridiculous Mm -hmm. you need to actually be like okay i'm just gonna do this a little bit and then i'll do a little bit and it's you know the best way to deal with it yeah you think about big picture and then you're like i don't want to do that no more that's that's like what, what am i getting myself into just like jumping in the deep end so the thing I found really hard about this project is that it's grown arms and legs. Because when I started it, I thought I want to write a space concept album, right? Done. That was nice and easy. Like mm-hmm. a lot of work, admittedly, but nice and easy. And then it was like, actually, I might want to do a story so that you can go along with it. And now I'm apparently being an author. I don't know where <laughs> that came from, you know. And then after that, like recently, I've gone, actually, you know what? I should release a single first. So I've written a single that's also going to get released. So I have another thing to record. And then it's it's just kind of spiraling because like um, I've got some ideas for like social media stuff to do with it. But then I'm going, how deep into this world building that I'm doing do I go? And uh, recently I haven't even finished, like I said, I haven't even finished the writing of the first album. And I'm going to be writing a second <laughs> because I've started, like there's another piece that doesn't work with this, but works with a continuation. And I'm literally like, okay, I can already see where I'm going to go story-wise. I haven't even got the full plot of the second bit. Um, and I'm already going, yeah, right, cool. This is two two concept albums. You're just, just punishing yourself, man. Right. You're a masochist for I sure. Know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A musical masochist, this guy, huh? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the inspiration for it? Like, you know, anything that inspired you to want to go in this direction for a, for a concept? Sure. Um, without giving too much away, it's, it's, it's an interesting one for me because I usually, if anyone listens to my music, uh, a lot of my music is uh, either quite relaxed and chilled or it comes out as quite pretty, I'd say. Like, it's quite, it's quite nice and, uh, you know, I, I usually write, like, quite uplifting things or sometimes mm-hmm. epic but definitely down the kind of uplifting vibe is something that I usually do this story is quite dark um, in comparison and 
the thing that's, that's just really fascinating about it is that I think a lot of it's come from my experiences with the frustrations of, of sometimes the day job and life and things I've observed and that other people have said to me and also probably in some ways mental health. Yeah, a lot of that experience is really kind of talking about creating quite a like it's quite a dystopian future thing that I'm creating. Um, which, like I said, is not my it's not my usual, but it's something I do think people relate to because the world that I'm creating is like I can't remember exactly. I think it's like a hundred years or it's it's a hundred and something years in the future, right? But mm-hmm. at the same time, there's a lot of things to do with this world that we can either see now or would be quite real. You can totally see this. It's not like it's not like fantasy in any way. It's just fantasy in terms of the setting. And mm-hmm. that it's futuristic. So I have some scope to say, hey, look, there's this thing that's not actually here yet in our world. But if you look at the way that the corporation and things are, are working, you can go, yeah, that, that that's possible. I can see that happening, unfortunately. Yeah. Exactly. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like toying with, you know, the, you know, like the fiction aspect, but also the, you know, real world's kind of, you know, social commentary of like how that could potentially happen, especially like with all the AI stuff going on, like, you know, how you see all that more and more coming Mm -hmm. out. And then, you know, you just think like, oh, I I hope no sort of extinction level threat starts to happen due to just our own technology coming back to kick us in the ass or something. It's just like, I I feel like if anything, technology is going to be like the, probably the thing that creates everything, but could potentially like destroy everything too if it just gets out of hand like yeah i wouldn't yeah. doubt it your roomba is gonna kill you for sure yeah yeah like roomba is gonna like become aware of itself and like instead of cleaning it just like starts like killing people and then like cleaning up the mess <laughs> you're gonna tell them what the concepts are about <laughs> oh, oh my bad yeah <laughs> we're spoiling it for people it's not, it's not the room it's the roomba it's killer roombas that's yeah. what it is <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it's an army of Roombas that get taken over. It's like a you ever seen that? Was it that new Chucky movie that came out? I think it was that remake. Didn't they have it like something where he like con- he started controlling all these other like toys and robots to like start attacking other people or something like that? I I, I think that's that movie. Missed that's that one. Con- yeah, that's not confusing. I mean, to be fair, I could totally see that working. Yeah, with- <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I don't need that. <laughs> I think he starts controlling it with like an app or something. Like, oh god. So, do you have a uh, soft landing date for for launching this puppy? Like, do you you have like uh, some sort of idea of when this is gonna go live? Yeah. Um, so my my hope really is saying next year. I'm really hoping that it's 2023. I I don't want it to become 2024 if I can help it, but. The stage I'm at is I've got four more tracks that needs uh, written lyrically and and like I've well I've got probably five tracks that needs properly looked at out of the eighteen or nineteen tracks that I've got. I need to track everything. I need to write ten and a half chapters, and uh, which is all doable from now until next year. But it's a crap ton of work. There's no way I would get it done. I don't think I would be able to get it done without like basically slaving over it if I wanted it out this year. Um, but I, I don't want it to get to like, you know, next year. Next year is comfortable. 24 mm-hmm. is just a little bit like I've clearly dropped something if, if it's 24. But if it is, it is, you know. 2024, you better get it out the door. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I've got a second concept album I to work on. So come on. Uh, yeah, like, right. well, you're like, yeah, it's going to it's just going to start piling up. Exactly. <laughs> That's cool, man. I'm definitely looking forward to hearing that. Seems like a really interesting thing. I love concept albums, so yeah, it's 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 really cool. I can also, for me, I can see like all the I can see a lot of influences with like the bands I was listening to back at the time, um, like whenever I wrote them. Because, like I said, this this one's also been birthed out of like pieces that I've like bits and pieces I've written years ago, and I was in a different place back then. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's some really, really interesting stuff, like taking a lot of people that I've been influenced by and like just making it my own. Like I would definitely say the album sounds like, um, I mean, even like, so my brother has, has been helping me with lyrics because um, he's, he's usually better at lyrics than I am. And um, like most of the time he's been listening to this and he's been like, oh, this sounds like you, but also this other band. And like basically every track has been, oh, this sounds like this band and you. <laughs> 
you know, and I'm like, that's great. That's what I want. I don't want it to be like, hey, this is a new, I don't know, Tool album. Like, it's not meant to be a Tool album. Yeah. It's meant to be David Shaw. But if there's any inspiration from that, cool. If there's not, fine. Yeah. Who's who are some of your influences in regards to some of the like more like proggy odd time sort of stuff? Uh, that's, uh, funnily enough, I would say that in some ways I would say like maybe recently probably more periphery. In terms of kind of the more proggy stuff, though, um, it's a bit of Dream Theater in there. Nice. Not sure quite how Dream Theater this one sounds, honestly, but there's, you know, like it, it sort of did pique my uh, my interest. Um, and even, I suppose, even kind of Opeth to an extent. There's oh, okay. a, little, a little bit of Opeth, actually. New or, new or old Opeth? I'd say old. Okay. Because their new um, stuff's like super fusion now. Like they almost sound like from the 70s or something. Like they don't even, it's just clean vocals and a lot of just like fusion yeah. rock. I remember, I remember when they came out with like Watershed was the first one for me that I was like, yeah, that's a good one. In a different, different direction. But yeah, like, so it's, it's quite funny. I haven't listened to Opeth in a while, but like there's, yeah, like I've got a track that I'm like, this sounds like it's been influenced to an extent just some really interesting stuff and it's not even i can't even say it's like one genre that's the thing that's really exciting mm. about it is that when i listen to it i have to say it's like probably a rock album or a or a prog album because mm. of that's probably the easiest way to say a space concept album is prog but <laughs> Mm -hmm. there's definitely some acoustic stuff in there there's definitely kind of some sort of synthy stuff there's there's a whole bunch of whole bunch of really interesting stuff yeah that's what i like about the the idea of prog because i think it's it's funny like people now or some people like refer to their music as prog because they do like odd time signatures like oh yeah it's it's a prog album it's like well what makes it prog oh well there's a lot of like you know that kind of thing but it's like you know, to me, when I was thinking of Prague, it's like like progressive music, like the music progresses and like goes in different places or like, you know, evolves. Like, how do you take like a, you know, super kind of metal idea and like turn it into this like soft orchestral landscape smoothly and like having it to where you're just on a journey? You know, that's the thing I've always loved about progressive music is how it's like it just kind of like flows in and out of these different ideas or brings back, you know, melodic motifs like Dream Theater, especially, you know, like they'll have certain melodic motifs that will go on you know different albums like, or even like mike portnoy was like doing a, a whole like 13 steps or was it like 12 step i think it was like a, like the 12 step program because he was you know getting off of you know, alcohol yeah. and, and trying to clean clean up and stuff and he was every album he would do this one the next you know fifth step sixth step but it would be a whole song based off of that and then kind of eventually become a whole album in itself and uh, and I always thought that kind of stuff was cool because it's like it's not just it's just an evolving idea over time. Yeah, yeah, it's there's some really really cool sort of stuff that you can get out of it. I mean, I mean, this is also one of the things I'm actually really fortunate, and I'm really in some ways glad that right now I'm quite a small artist because it means that like I don't have. I mean, it would be nice to have a bigger fan base. Everyone would like that, but mm -hmm. on the plus side. I currently don't have as much of a fan base, which means I have more scope to experiment without people saying, oh, hey, I really like their stuff. But like, because like I do a lot of orchestral stuff. Orchestral stuff is stuff that I, I really love writing. Mm -hmm. And I do an awful lot of orchestral stuff. I'm now doing a prog rock album. Like if I had just a massive fan base, the amount of people that would probably revolt and be like, this, this, isn't, this isn't me. But at the same time, I'm, I'm able to do that right now. And yeah. if, you know, if more people find the music after that, great. If they yeah. don't, that's fine too. <laughs> the cool thing about what you're doing with, you know, maybe having a little bit of a smaller fan base and, and building it over time is that, you know, when this thing comes out, people are going to be like, oh, this is, you know, you, they might associate it with you. The fact that it's so diverse, you know, it's like when you think of bands like Dream Theater or Between the Bear to Me, like their whole thing is that they do whatever they want. Yeah. And I think that's the really cool thing when you're that kind of band where, oh, like all of a sudden they come out with like a polka riff and they're like, that's cool. That's what they do. Like, and I think that's awesome. Like, you know, being an artist and being like, I can't do that because my fan base is going to crucify me. Yeah. Like that is the worst. You know, it's like, it's, it's really nice to have that creativity because I mean, I mean, suppose even composers get like pigeonholed into like genres. Mm -hmm. so you find a lot of composers that like they'll just do action films or they'll just do romantic comedies or whatever and like 
it doesn't mean that they can't do something else, but like that's where their work comes from. That's what they get known for. And that's that's kind of how all that sort of comes about. And it's like, it's even, even the same as artists, like as artists grow and develop a fan base, like some, depending on the fan base, some people would be like, yeah, if, if you don't start off kind of diverse, and I'm not saying you have to, you can quite happily and comfortably make a career of just one genre or two genres, but it's just nice to, to have that freedom. Yeah. You know? I mean, one of the songs I've got, I mean, my Spotify is mainly like, yeah, of all the stuff I've released, like I said, it's mainly orchestral because it's mainly soundtracks, but like... Um, I released two albums this year. Uh, I did one called Year One, which has got like some acoustic tracks on it, some some sort of synthier tracks, some like chill tracks. I've got an ambient track on there. I've got a Sea Shanty as a single elsewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's just just diversity is like what I love. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's nice to you know yeah keep it fresh and not have to stick to one genre. It's like like a like Jason Graves. You know, he always got kind of typecasted as like, oh, Jason Graves, you know, horror, scary music, you know, with Dead Space and, you know, all these other types of things. And you think of him doing something like Moss, which is very complete opposite, you yeah. know, but he loves that kind of stuff. And it's like not everything is just doing horror or one thing. It's like I would think eventually you just get like, oh, like I want to switch it up. Just do, go the complete opposite for a little bit, you know, just to you know keep your sanity. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So could you tell us about some hobbies or interests outside of music that you have? Like, what do you do when you're not working on music? That is a good question because I don't do a lot outside of working on music. I usually work on music. <laughs> nice. But, um, but when you don't. <laughs> when I don't. When I don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, usually uh, I, I would probably... Like, I, I really love playing video games and watching films, like, especially, and I mean, again, slightly musical, like, I'm yeah. usually analyzing when I'm doing that, mm-hmm. but that's probably, like, my, that's, like, my main thing that I would do. Um, doesn't mean that I don't, like, go outside, you know, I do actually, like, get dragged out occasionally. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think, I think, like, when I'm not, when I'm not making music, like, to switch off and stuff, I'm usually, like playing playing something or uh, or watching films for sure although i'm like super old school and have like a massive like dvd collection still nice rather than rather than uh yeah i still have a working vhs player hey man i'm with you on that <laughs> like you know what's funny it's like do you remember like because i was you know growing up that like movies and and drawing were like my first favorite things and like i used to miss going to like Hollywood video or blockbuster or video, you know, whatever video place they used to be next to you. And just like going there and just like picking out stuff. Like, cause we have a couple of DVD racks in our garage, just like full of DVDs. And it's like, it's nice to when you can just go in there and like, what do I want to watch? And just kind of going through and like, p- like physically picking DVDs and like bringing them in, even if it's like, you know, stuff you've already seen, like, it's kind of fun to do that. I mean, you could just like scroll on Netflix or Hulu or whatever for hours, but it's kind of fun to just, yeah, go back into that like just picking out a dvd oh this is cool or oh man i haven't watched this in years you know that, that kind of stuff so i think i think it's nice I think to it's sort really of... nice about it like owning it as well though is that mm-hmm. like there's not that that dilemma you get with like netflix or amazon prime or anything where like see if you like get a, a hankering almost and you're like you know i want to see this film specifically and then you yeah. go to that thing you type it in and it's like oh we don't have that anymore and you're like, <laughs> yeah. You know? Whereas, like, you check the DVD shelf, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. I, I can just watch that for the millionth time. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, don't get me wrong. The subscription services can be like really. It can be really cool to discover new stuff, but sometimes, like, and like you said about endlessly scrolling, it's just it's it can be so soul destroying. Especially, you can spend as long as you would if you just picked a movie. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, just trying to find the movie. Yeah, you're like I don't even want to watch anything anymore. I'm over it. Like yeah. I've been, I've been just like my thumb is sore, my eyes are burning, and I'm <laughs> upset, and I'm not entertained. And then you just end up probably watching something you've already seen anyway. Ah, screw it. I'll just like you know, like me and my girlfriend are like oh, let's just put on Breaking Bad again. And then I'm just like, but I can watch that. I can watch Breaking Bad back to back forever, or like The yeah. Office or something. Like yeah, just throw, put that on. It's like always good kind of thing. So that leads me into the next question, which is, do you have a favorite YouTube channel, podcast, or TV show at the moment? Something that you've been enjoying recently? Um, that is a good question. I I actually don't 
consume a heck of a lot of media, actually. You could tell us about like a favorite uh, genre of movies or video games. Like what what are you uh, playing or watching uh, if you're taking a couple hours off? Sure. Um, I'd say in terms of genre, like I would say that the probably some kind of action film is usually like my go to in terms of games like i really love story based games um i mean doesn't mean i don't like multiplayers but like i i do love really interesting like games sometimes even with interesting physics i've actually been replaying the metal gear solid series and mm-hmm. um, the story is off the wall it's mm-hmm. absolutely ridiculous and i still don't think i've got my head fully around it but i love the just how complex the like so just some of the intricacies that they've made the ai do and it just, it's just it's such a well put together game and um, mm-hmm. the music's great too obviously i feel like i have to say that mm-hmm. <laughs> um and but yeah like in terms of like and, and like i said in terms of films like i've got um our our dvd shelves are and game shelves are um organized by genre rather than like oh that's cool alphabetized and i literally have one shelf of action whereas like the other shelf has like comedy and ghibli movies and anime and disney and whole, like basically a whole bunch of other stuff and then like i said i've just got this massive collection i've built up of just like things from like super cheesy action films you know like with james bond and like star wars and lord of the rings and stuff to like random films like man on fire and um uh, true romance and things that are just mm-hmm. like yeah just really really cool things have you ever seen a movie called the raid since you're an act uh, you're an action buff i've i've not seen the raid it's one it's oh one of man best. that if you like action that movie is off the wall like there's a movie another one called uh, the night comes for us on netflix that's actually another really good one Mm-hmm. Kind of, kind of similar, but a little bit different in like different types of cinematography. But man, if you want to watch a good horror movie or not horror movie, oh god, action movie. <laughs> I'm, I'm still stuck. On, my brain's always in horror. Uh, good action movie. Yeah, the raid is ridiculous. Oh, Have definitely. You- I mean, I will. I will check it out. The, the thing that I absolutely love, like my um, my like favorite films are films that you where there's twists and you don't expect it. Mm-hmm. Like, I must admit, like thrillers, especially that's that's the thing that I just absolutely thrive on. Mm-hmm. You know, so so like the Usual Suspects, Seven, Usual that Suspects. kind of stuff. Oh yeah, man, yeah. Seven, so good. Great movies, absolutely great movies. Nice. Yeah. Have you seen RRR on Netflix? I it's, have not. It's a Indian cinema that just came out a few months ago, and it's like a tiny bit musical, like a huge amount action, but it's. It's like a huge budget Indian movie and it's absolutely batshit crazy. It's yeah. <laughs> it's really worth watching if you're like interested at all in Indian cinema. Uh like the lights, the music, the action is really well done. It's very big budget. So uh it's super long, but um it's it's on Netflix and it's it's worth checking out just just for the colors. It's explosive. And when yeah. you say long, are you saying like like Forrest Gump long? Like that's how I compare. It's three, it's three it? hours. Oh, okay. So yeah. not quite Forrest Gump. How long is Forrest Gump? I think it's like four hours. Is or it? almost. <laughs> Maybe three and a half. I don't think it's four. It feels like it feels like eight hours. That movie, uh, like I feel like it takes me a whole day to watch it. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> it's two it's, hours twenty-two. What is it? <laughs> two twenty-two. Oh man. <laughs> I was looking up the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does drag, though. I'll give you that. It dude. does. It does. That's hilarious. Um, okay, the next question is: best recent purchase under a hundred dollars. I don't think I have recently. I did. I, I can probably give you a best purchase under a hundred dollars, or at least one of them. Like the, probably my most used thing. Hit me. Um, I think one of the the instruments I, I really like um it's almost slightly lo-fi in a way because uh, it's I wouldn't say like it's a little bit kind of low fidelity but the hammered dulcimer from cinematics uh, instruments I think are the that's something that I have I've used on an awful lot of scores and it's actually probably like it's it's quite a good hammered dulcimer nice that's cool I think I have that one actually. I think I remember getting that like years ago. 
Yeah, it's it's one of these like it's one of these sort of like little gems that is is really cool. You can set the mod wheel to be um like, like rolls. Like rolls. Yeah. yeah. And it's just so it's it's quite expressive. I mean the only thing with it is that like there is reverb baked in. So it's not it's not the driest instrument, which does mean in certain situations it can be a little tricky to work with. But mm. it's it's got um quite a nice Got quite a nice sound. You do have to be careful with velocity layers, though, because uh, um, kind of between the mid- like medium and high, like it just kind of like fire in all cylinders. And so, if you hit a note <laughs> wrong, you do have to kind of go back and fix it. I I have two more questions for you. The first one is with the Twitch stuff. Are you setting up some sort of like email collection or some sort of way to communicate with your fans off of Twitch? I know like um, one of the guys I follow 8-Bit Music on Twitch, he just started a Patreon and he was saying like Patreon takes much less of a cut than Twitch. And so he was like, I, I know that Patreon exists and I've known for years, but I just am just getting around to it. Um, like collecting that information from your customers uh, seems to be pretty important to get them off platform. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say I'm the best at marketing. I have a lot to learn. We all do. Because <laughs> I probably should do more stuff. Um, Patreon is something I have looked into slightly, and by that I mean I've probably put it on a list along with Fiverr and said, "Hey, I should do that." And that's about as far as I've got. Um, but in terms of uh, Twitch, the one thing I have seen a lot of, and I have got myself, is that most people who have a Twitch channel doesn't mean that you have to do this, but most people that do have set up their own Discord server. Mm. And so I have done that um, usually as a way of announcing to people like anything, really, frankly, if you have, you know, you can set up your server in near enough anyway, and it doesn't cost anything. It does take, I mean, again, it takes time to learn, figure out what, how to make it work. But um, yeah, I, I set mine up probably, I think about a year after starting Twitch. And it was because I noticed every time I went into someone's channel, they all, everyone has a Discord. Um Word of warning to anybody that ends up getting into Twitch and streaming and stuff, uh, you will start collecting Discord servers like it's going out of fashion, frankly. Because <laughs> um, I know that I have I have quite a few that I'm part of and some I probably have to have the another sort of look at if I'm actually engaging. Um, but that's usually kind of a good place because when I was starting Twitch, it's quite hard kind of getting back to what you were saying about the uh, about routine and like having a schedule. It's super important. But like if people don't know what it is, it's kind of tricky. So that's why a lot of people use uh, servers um, on Discord, because, you know, basically, if you like that artist or whoever's streaming the streamer, you go on there and they can have a live announcement saying, hey, we're live now. You can have a. You know, like if there is any reason that they're not able to stream, you can just put an announcement out. Um, and it's sometimes easier than being like, well, I mean, I was basically for the first year, year and a half, like uh, like all my socials, literally the only thing I put out was, hey, I'm going live in an hour. You know, that was that was basically, basically it, um, which sometimes worked, sometimes didn't. Um, and frankly, it's also a good way to lose uh, audience interest. Sure. Like on things like Instagram and stuff, if that's all you're saying is I'm going live on Twitch, unless you've got like some reason people are actually coming to your channel, a lot of people will see it and they'll be like, oh, he's just constantly saying that, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not interested, unfollow, like don't want to hear it anymore. I'm unringing that bell, you know, yeah. like, that's the sort yeah. of thing. So it's I'm like... smashing the unlike button because I'm <laughs> sick of this. <laughs> exactly. Um <laughs> So yeah, like having a Discord server is just so nice because it means that like people can come in and they can actually engage with me. Like I'm there. They can they can send me a message. They can chat. They can ask questions uh, if they want. They can put memes in the memes channel. They can you know they can do whatever they want um, like within reason. And um, it means people also know if I'm going to be live or if I'm going to be on holiday or whatever it is. I can just I can just put it there and I'm not annoying anybody. Mm-hmm. Nice. My last question for you is, uh, what goals do you see yourself achieving in the f- next couple of years? What's next for you? I will have released a concept album. <laughs> Love it. We're going to hold you to that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> Honestly, like I, yeah, it's yeah. So aside from, aside from the concept album, um, I've actually, I'm actually working on technically four albums right now. <laughs> 
Um, it kind of keeps growing. So I'm working on this concept album and I've got three that I have in sort of development that is stuff that I have written on Twitch. I am planning on releasing uh, albums of the music because a lot of people, because we right. usually write a track in an evening and then people say, hey, I want to listen to that or, um, but it's, it's rough. So I need to go mix and master it and decide, you know, so there's a whole bunch of stuff. Those ones are kind of on the back burner at the minute, but they are kind of uh, on my sort of radar. Aside from that, I think the usual composer grind of like want to do more, uh, more video games and more more sort of things get like just make more music frankly that's kind of my that plate full man keeping that plate full exactly exactly um but no the the concept album is is definitely like the the number one thing and honestly like the thing that's kind of killing me inside a lot is that like i i have a i have a couple of really really cool tracks with it so far and obviously they aren't fully recovered like uh, recorded i basically essentially got demos but man do you just want to share it with the world yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, <laughs> I'm like having to be like, no, but like inside, I've been going screaming for like mm-hmm. months now because some of them are, are like in that kind of demo state. And I'm like, this will be amazing when it's done, but it's just right now, you know, as much as I want to show you all, mm-hmm. I can't yet. But trust me, it will be cool. Nice. It's classified. Love it, man. Well, uh, we'll have to have you back on in uh, a year or so when it's when it's released and it's do, released. Some, <laughs> do some streaming, show off the single, all that stuff. Um, so thanks so much for coming on. This was fun. Yeah, dude. Yeah, it's nice to nice to sit and talk with you because I mean, another uh, beta composer who I've talked mostly through email. And <laughs> yeah, it's always cool. Like when like when we get to bring people on and just kind of sit and chat. So yeah, thanks for taking the time to hang out, man. And no sharing, yeah, sharing with the the noobs about Twitch. We're uh, yeah. we're rookies. Yeah. <laughs> Until next year when you've like cracked it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Uh, we will catch you soon, Craig. Catch you next week. Yeah, man. Take care. <laughs>